This is Fallout, the legacy of Chernobyl. Swedish scientists have detected a sharp increase in the level of radiation in the atmosphere. They say it could have been caused by a leak at a nuclear power station in Russia. The Soviet Union has admitted that an accident has taken place at a nuclear power station at Chernobyl in the Ukraine. The Soviet authorities are telling the world very little about what is happening there, but it's clear that a disaster of major proportions has occurred. It was April 1986, and news of a nuclear accident in Ukraine began to alarm the world. The main television news here announced that two people were killed in the nuclear accident. The structure, it says, was destroyed and there was a leak of radioactive substance. But has the emotional and political fallout from Chernobyl been more damaging than the radiation? Ever since what is indisputably the world's worst nuclear accident, scientists and doctors have found themselves embroiled in an angry debate between pro- and anti-nuclear lobbyists. Even now, there's deep controversy over a fundamental question. How many people died, or have yet to die, because of Chernobyl? The drama started, as at Fukushima, with a broken steam pipe. Power stations can't explode like a nuclear bomb. Their raw materials aren't volatile enough. But when they're shut down, they take time to cool off, and old designs need running water to act as a refrigerant. But Chernobyl was only two years old, not 40 like Fukushima. There was no earthquake in Ukraine, no tsunami, just incompetence and cheap design. On April the 26th, night staff at reactor number 4 carried out a test that should have been completed before the plant was opened. They let so much heat build up that the water cooling system burst. In searing temperatures and pressures, H2O separated into hydrogen and oxygen, causing an explosion of gases that blew off the roof. It all sounds so familiar. The Japanese government is playing down fears of disaster after an explosion at a nuclear power station. A wall and roof reportedly blew out at the Fukushima No. 1 plant. A white cloud was clearly visible rising from the site. But while the reactors in Japan had several layers of shielding, at Chernobyl, the roof was all that separated the doomed reactor from the outside world. With that roof gone, hot graphite around the core was exposed to air and caught fire. Smoke billowed high into the atmosphere, spreading radioactive isotopes over 75,000 square miles of Europe. Anti-nuclear campaigners, who are now focusing their attention on Japan, believe there's been a huge death toll from Chernobyl. It's been widely reported that half a million people have already died, with many more likely to become victims in the future. The radiation has been blamed for a huge range of illnesses, as well as stillbirths and deformities two decades after the catastrophe. Baby Masha is fighting for her life. She was born prematurely because her mother lives in an area contaminated by radioactivity. Thousands of people born after the disaster suffer from the consequences of the Chernobyl catastrophe. But is there evidence to substantiate the kind of claims made in that Greenpeace film? It's time to separate fact from fiction, science from anecdote. Not that the nuclear industry itself has been averse to propaganda of its own. But since Chernobyl, it's been mostly on the defensive, as I discovered by coincidence as I set off to travel to Ukraine. Arriving at Heathrow, I was next in the security queue to the emeritus chair of the UK Atomic Energy Agency, Lady Barbara Judge. And after hearing what I was up to, she complained that Chernobyl was, and remains, the greatest stumbling block to the credibility of nuclear power. Chernobyl has closed down the nuclear industry for 20 years. We are continually fighting against the myth of Chernobyl. We are continually fighting against what people say happened in Chernobyl and what actually happened in Chernobyl. Alarmist stories about Chernobyl rankle with many doctors and scientists too. Professor Jerry Thomas is a leading medical scientist and expert in molecular pathology who coordinates the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, a global project that monitors illness from the fallout. Talk to her about claims of malformed babies and 100,000 dead in Belarus alone, and she gets outraged. That really is crazy. The, the fact that there has been a cancer incident in Belarus subsequent to the accident is not surprising because there is a cancer incident in this country and we weren't exposed to the radiation from Chernobyl. Cancer, unfortunately, is a natural consequence of life. A proportion of a population anywhere will die from cancer. So to suggest that just taking baseline figures and deaths in a population from cancer and to equate that with radiation exposure is just quite simply wrong. 
But if much of the reporting on Chernobyl has been inaccurate or fanciful, some of the wilder claims have been fueled by suspect science. Professor Thomas speaks for many when she voices frustration at what she sees as poor and alarmist research, some from official authorities in Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. Intense health monitoring is finding problems that look new, but were almost certainly there unnoticed in the past. You're talking about flawed experimental design and therefore leading to bad science and the wrong conclusions being drawn. It's very important that in a scientific study you always have a control group to use as a comparison. Then you can tell if there's real differences or whether the differences you're seeing are just by chance. And in some of those studies, certainly what they've seen is not a real difference. It isn't statistically viable, it just happens to be an incidental finding. What isn't in dispute is that four years after the accident, doctors in the region began to notice an increase in the number of children and teenagers developing thyroid cancer. The increase was so fast and so alarming, it couldn't just be due to better screening and diagnosis. Put here, it's, it's tumour, mm -hmm. I guess. Russian pathologist Dr. Alexander Abrosimov. He's a member of an international group of specialists yeah. which gathers regularly to examine thyroid tumours taken from children who were growing up near Chernobyl at the time of the disaster. And one piece of so-called mushroom time invasive growth typical marker of follicular cancer. The Chernobyl Tissue Bank is coordinated from London and stores thousands of cancers removed from patients in Belarus, Ukraine and parts of Russia. It's a scientific treasure trove. I thought that there would be an increase in thyroid lesions because of the radioactive iodine. Dr. Virginia Livolsi, who's an internationally acclaimed pathologist from the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. We had Three Mile Island in the late 1970s, and it was very interesting that immediately the Department of Health started to mobilize themselves to give the children potassium iodide to saturate their thyroids so that whatever radioactive iodide came out of the reactor couldn't get into the thyroid and therefore cause whatever damage it was going to cause because the thyroid was loaded with iodine. That was not even thought of in Chernobyl. In Poland, I think they did give the children. I believe iodine. they did, but, you know, in Ukraine and stuff like that, they didn't. It should have been a basic response to a nuclear accident. Radio iodine is short-lived, but even small amounts can get concentrated in cow's milk, which is why in Japan they quickly dispensed iodine tablets to children near Fukushima. But in much of the Soviet Union, children were left without protection. Some, who drank milk in 1986, later became ill, with girls more vulnerable than boys. New York endocrinologist Professor Mike Tuttle specializes in thyroid cancer. The first time I was over there and saw the pediatric thyroid cancer clinic, and the line was around the wall and down the door, and in one day I saw more kids with thyroid cancer than I'd seen my entire career. If those children had been given iodine as a preventative measure, would they have got thyroid cancer? Yeah, the short answer is no. The thyroid cancer epidemic has now been closely monitored for 20 years and is the starkest evidence of how far-reaching radioactive pollution can be. At the Academy of Medical Science in Kiev, 60 miles south of Chernobyl, Professor Mikolo Tronko, director of the Institute of Endocrinology, assembled a panel of doctors and researchers for me and delivered a presentation to lead me through what they now know. So here we present the incidence of the thyroid cancer in those who were children at the time of the Chernobyl accident. Before the Chernobyl accident, the incidence of the thyroid cancer was 0 0.06 per 100,000. And there were some areas where this incidence was 2.3 after the Chernobyl accident. So we are talking about uh, multiplying by 10 times the incidence of cancer. That still makes thyroid cancer rare, but in a big population, it leads to big numbers. So just how many children were affected? In our database, in, the, in our institute, we have 6,049 children with thyroid cancer. How many people do you think have died as a result of thyroid cancer? As far as we know, we are talking about six people who died. It's about percentages, it's very, very small percentage. 
That was the consensus from everyone I spoke to. Six deaths which can't be disassociated from Chernobyl. Each was a tragedy, but I was surprised that the death rate was so low. Somehow, uh, also thyroid cancer, unlike other cancers seen in childhood, it's more curable. It can be treated by surgery and later on, if some lesions are seen as metastasis in the lungs or lymph nodes, they also can be found and treated by the radioactive iodine. But even curable cancer is highly distressing, and I wanted to meet some of the patients, like Olna, who's just had a second operation. She was born um, before Chernobyl accident, 27 years old, papillary thyroid carcinoma. Yeah. During uh, 90. 86, uh, she was in Kyiv. How did you discover that you had thyroid cancer? I had a high temperature, and during the medical examination, a uh, patient was referred to our clinic for ultrasound to discover thyroid cancer here. It's possible that your cancer was related to the accident at Chernobyl, at the, at the power plant. Does that make you angry? I don't angry, but um, in my childhood I have the certificate that I have uh, polluted from Chernobyl. She, uh, uh, she show now. So this is a little identity card this you carry. This is a certificate that a child who suffer from Chernobyl accident. So, 6,000 cancers, six of them fatal. There are many experts who are convinced that thyroid cancer will turn out to be the only demonstrable long-term health legacy of Chernobyl. Professor Livolsi again. It's now been 25 years, and it does not seem as though any other organ system is going to be affected by malignant tumors. If we were going to start to see an epidemic of breast cancer, for instance, or lung cancer, or the kinds of cancers that are difficult to cure. We should have started to see that by now. And we haven't. I'm heading by car from Kiev to Chernobyl, a distance of 60 miles or so. And never having gone to the site of the accident before, I'm naturally a bit concerned. Just how dangerous is radiation? Beside me is Vadim Chamak from the Ukraine Research Center for Radiation Medicine, who's responsible for monitoring emissions from the plant. Okay, so we are still traveling in Kyiv, and we are heading to Chernobyl, and uh, I have with me a survey meter, which uh, can measure uh, gamma radiation. So while I was talking, it uh, showed 0.10 microsievert per hour. So uh, I can tell you that it's absolutely normal natural background, Vadim knows his stuff, he has to. His health, and that of all those still working at Chernobyl, relies on his expertise. In Vadim's view, people who know most about radiation are least scared of it. And as he points out, many whole populations in some parts of the world are subjected to quite high levels of background radiation. Uh, as far as I know, it is the highest is the Kerala state in uh, India. Uh, and it is about uh, 50 millisievert per hour. So that's 50 times the, the level here? It is uh, 500 times. 500 times? Yes. And people are not showing any signs of elevated risk of cancer or other problems? Uh, surprisingly not. But nobody is now taking chances at Chernobyl. 20 miles before we get there, we reach a barrier like an officious rural border crossing. No one gets in without official passes, signed waivers and an escort. In our case, an army officer. The exclusion zone even looks like a different world. We pass deserted hamlets where nature has reclaimed the streets and trees grow through the houses. Soon there's the first indication of where we're going, giant, long, redundant power lines. And then the abandoned facility. First, two never completed reactor buildings that were due to be numbered five and six. And finally, the unmistakable hulk of reactor four. Its once iconic red and white chimney has faded to grey. Its concrete sarcophagus is plainly crumbling. Construction teams are laying tracks so that a vast new enclosure can be rolled across to cover it. So this is about as close to the power station as we can get to Unit 4 without actually going in it. What's the reading now? 
Okay, it's now uh, 1.28 microzeer per hour. It's uh, 13 times higher than in Kiev. And does that worry you? Uh, unless I stay here for the rest of my life, not. I'm intrigued that Vadim isn't worried. He comes here time and again, often going into the stricken reactor itself. It's not that he discounts the dangers. He, more than almost anyone, understands the perils of ionizing radiation. But most of us overestimate it, what one Ukrainian expert calls radiophobia. So how can we know if a few people were victims or thousands were? The main problem is that, uh, for instance, every year a certain amount of people die from heart attacks. Every year a certain amount of people die from cancer. And this number is quite large. Uh, definitely we cannot point with our finger and say this guy died from Chernobyl and this guy died because of... Uh, of heart attack not related to Chernobyl. What we are doing in, in our research, we are trying to identify this small extra number on top of a large number of spontaneous uh, effects. And uh, for, for some diseases we can do it, like for uh, thyroid cancer in children, because it was zero background, virtually zero background, it was a quite a number of uh, thyroid cancers for children, and it's obvious. For uh, leukemia, it's almost marginal, so it's not statistically significant. That's a main problem. So we will never know if hardly anybody died as a direct result of the radiation from Chernobyl, other than the early victims, or whether thousands did. Definitely some people die. Definitely, there's no question. I cannot tell you how many, and I'm afraid nobody can tell you. We do know two people died in the explosion at Chernobyl, 134 engineers and emergency workers were exposed to extremely high-dose radiation, of whom 28 died within four months and 19 from various causes have died since. Add six deaths through thyroid cancer, that's a total of 50 or 60 fatalities in total. Anything beyond 50 or 60, some say, is simply speculation. But a group of local doctors and scientists insists new evidence is emerging. In the days that followed the accident, the Soviet authorities created the 20-mile exclusion zone around Chernobyl and eventually evacuated 135,000 people. But over the last quarter of a century, 200,000 workers have been drafted in to seal the doomed reactor and to clear away the worst of the contamination. They're called liquidators. Doctors monitoring those who were there in the first few months say the proportion with health problems far exceeds the norm. At the Research Centre for Radiation Medicine, I was introduced to liquidators attending a clinic run by Professor Victor Sushko. His first patient had been given the unenviable task of monitoring radiation levels on the roof of the wrecked reactor immediately after the accident. He was there for days and then back on site routinely for several years. Uh, this is Starodumov Valery Mikhailovich. He is 66 years old. Uh, he and his group was the first who estimate the radiation exposure. Do you blame the radiation for ill health since? Not all of them, but uh, part of them, I'm sure that it deals with the influence of the radiation. What do you think was caused by radiation? It was a developed a cataract, and uh, the lens was changed. And the retina of the eye needs operation too. And uh, tyroid goiter. And these diseases, uh, according to the opinion of our patient, deals with the influence of radiation. And I'm great with him. Ну из группы нас осталось из 15 человек на сегодняшний день шесть. From the group of about 13 persons, today lived six. The seven who, who died, what did they die of? Different things or? What последний из них One person from these seven died from the cancer. Other main reason was cardiovascular disease. Stradomov and his colleagues were high-dose liquidators and there's broad agreement that excessive radiation can cause cataracts and leukemia. There's less consensus about illnesses in general. Professor Sushko's next patient was 54-year-old Vladimir Bori. 
Vladimir tells me he was one of over a thousand bus drivers drafted in the night after the accident to evacuate the town of Pripyat, two miles from the stricken reactor. He understands that this is a risk for his health, but he have to uh, help these people and uh, their families and so on. And what has your health been like since then? He very quickly began to be tired uh, when he came for medical care. It's typical liquidator. He has a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But Vladimir admits he's a heavy smoker, which is a much more likely cause of lung disease. And some Western experts suspect that local doctors are more inclined to see a causal link with radiation than do scientists from abroad who tend to be more sceptical. Professor Sushko, on the other hand, insists there are correlations too. His clinic keeps tabs on 5,000 liquidators, comparing them with people who never visited Chernobyl. And he and colleagues are increasingly convinced that as the years go by, more evidence is emerging of general malaise, as well as leukaemia and other cancers. Today, our scientists uh, find uh, evidence-based excess. It's for breast cancer, uh, all other kinds of of solid cancers need more and more uh, studies. And uh, of course, the studies need funding. But you're saying there is some evidence of increased breast cancer? Breast cancer, yes. And there is a statistically significant yes, increase? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, but uh, when we speak about uh, medical uh, consequences of the Chernobyl catastrophe, it's not only a cancer. It's a general decreasing of health of uh, population who undergone the influence of the Chernobyl catastrophe. Uh, firstly, cardiovascular pathology and of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Professor Sushko's view is widely held in Kiev. It was scientists at the Research Center for Radiation Medicine there who first identified the problem of thyroid cancer among children. And one of the researchers, Dmitry Bazika, is now deputy director of the center, and today he's trying to persuade the world that his unit is ahead of other scientists with their liquidator studies too. Now we have so-called statistical or radiobiological data about the increase of leukemia, the increase of some cancers, like, for example, breast cancer in female cleanup workers, excess of uh, cancer of the bladder, and some data about the tendency to increase of lung cancer. So, in total, the risks of all cancers increase uh, 11%. 11, and that's easily statistically significant then? Yes. Little of this has yet been accepted by the international scientific community. But Professor Bazika and his colleagues say time will prove them right. He points to survivors of the atom bomb at Hiroshima, where raised incidence of leukaemia was later followed by higher levels of solid cancers too. So if the risks are the same, for leukemia, there is, in radiobiology, there are some rules. And one of these rules is if you have excess of leukemia, then you will have excess of cancers. But I speak only about the cleanup workers for general population. We haven't shown that. So what does he think of the claims by anti-nuclear groups who say that the radiation leak has already claimed many thousands of lives throughout Ukraine, Belarus and Russia, and that many more will die in the future? We can say that we can't see at the moment any statistical evidence on the increase of uh, cancers in all the population. But if the years will come and we will have more statistical power, we can make the proper conclusions in future. So even after 25 years, attempting to quantify the fatalities is still elusive. No one likes uncertainty. Eight years ago, the United Nations gathered 100 experts from around the world, and after two years, that Chernobyl forum did come up with figures, albeit cautious ones. The radiation leak might cause 4,000 fatal cancers in the most contaminated areas. Looking at Europe as a whole, the figures rise. 
One of the forum's principal authors is Professor Elizabeth Cardis, an expert on the impact of radiation on public health from the Centre for Research and Environmental Epidemiology in Barcelona. She acknowledges there are huge uncertainties in the figures. But, extrapolating from atom bomb survivors, Professor Cardis now predicts there might in all be 40,000 extra cancers, leading to 16,000 premature deaths. We've actually done a number of, est- of guesstimations, basically. and But these really were meant to give an order of magnitude of the potential impact. I mean, 40,000 cases of cancer sounds like a lot. But if you compare it to the normal incidence of cancer in Europe, it's less than 0.01% of all cancers that occur for other reasons in Europe. In that report, the last report that you co-signed, you specifically said that uh, we've got to be careful about taking Hiroshima and Nagasaki as our baseline because the applicability of risk estimates derived from other populations with different backgrounds, as well as having been exposed to much higher radiation dose rates, is unclear. And you also said, moreover, small differences in the assumptions about the risks from exposure to low-level radiation doses can lead to large differences in the predictions of increased cancer burden. So you're really hedging this around. These are these are guesses rather than predictions. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they're educated guesses. And I've spoken to some physicists and, and some medics who say that low-dose radiation may not harm us at all. In fact, uh, we've evolved to survive in a world and flourish in a world that is surrounded by radiation. What's your view of that? Is, is there a straight line increase as the dose increases, the danger increases? Well, it's, it's, it's not clear at all. I mean, there, there is a big scientific debate. And I think that there are scientists who, in good faith, based on their experimental work, conclude that low doses of radiation do not in- increase the risk of cancer and might actually even protect us against the effects of radiation. I don't know, but certainly from the epidemiological evidence that that we have, there's mounting epidemiological evidence that there appears to be a small risk of cancer even at low doses. Maybe, and it still seems to be the leading theory. But even if it's right, the risk for any individual is almost vanishingly small. Far lower, for example, than ordinary urban smog, which kills millions around the world each year. And there's a growing view that all this talk of radiation is itself a threat to health. Distrust of the authorities on the one hand and scare stories on the other led to anxiety, fatalism and depression among the local population. The abortion rate soared. Refugees evacuated from Chernobyl were stigmatised because people were frightened of them. This psychological trauma gets much less publicity than physical disease, but it's palpable to doctors who visit the area routinely. American endocrinologist Mike Tuttle. When you begin to look at the medical consequences, I think we're not to underestimate the psychological consequences. I don't think we've seen a huge amount of cancers and tumors and death, but was it still a medical disaster? Yeah, because there are thousands and millions of people that were exposed to radiation that continue to live every day worried if they're going to develop another cancer. But are you saying the worst health consequence has been fear rather than actual disease? Yeah, this always gets you in trouble when you say that, but the answer I think is yes. The cancers that we've seen have been thyroid cancers. They're very treatable, as you've heard, and most people are going to survive that. We haven't seen a big increase in other cancers, and I think one of the biggest consequences that there was was the individual people that were radiated that are doing fine right now 25 years after the road. But if they get a cold or something hurts or they get a new lump, a year from now, two years, five years from now, they're worried about whether it was caused by the Chernobyl accident. Professor Tuttle's not alone in thinking Chernobyl has become a scapegoat within the region, a convenient metaphor for other problems since the fall of communism. Semyon Glusman is a psychiatrist a man not afraid to speak against prevailing views. He's a former dissident who spent 10 years in the gulag for exposing Soviet abuse of psychiatry. And today, he's equally outspoken about what he regards as political abuse of Chernobyl. First by the communists who tried to deny there was a problem. Now, he says, Chernobyl is blamed for every illness and everything that's wrong. He despairs that so many have vested interests in talking up the scale of the catastrophe. 
and he's particularly incensed by what he sees as a new abuse of his own field, psychiatry, which claims that Chernobyl is responsible for widespread psychosis. Some of uh, Ukrainian uh, professors became very active to have grants, money, that it will be schizophrenia, it will be everything. But of course it's lie and this is myth and everybody in the Western countries and even majority psychiatrists in my country know that this is not so. Dr. Glusman acknowledges that his skepticism doesn't always go down well in his native Ukraine. Along with the US psychiatrist Professor Evelyn Bromit, he conducted a large study of the psychiatric health impact of Chernobyl and found that bad news was often more popular than good. When we finished our research, I need to give real, serious information to these guys and ladies that they are healthy. They don't want to have this information. They want to have information that they have all diseases and every disease is from radiation. And why did they want to know that? Why did they want to be told that? Because people had poison from information. Now we have you know, maybe every third uh, person in Ukraine is victim of Chernobyl officially. They have small money from this. And uh, of course, the biggest myth that uh, we had uh, every our disease was from radiation. And I think that this myth is not dead. Whatever the uncertainties about the wider health consequences of Chernobyl, there's no doubting the huge social and economic costs. They hit you most when you go beyond the plant itself to the city that's two miles down the road. So now we can come to uh, Pripyat. So now it's completely abandoned uh, town. This was once home to 50,000 people. And as Vadim Chamuk sees it, for many of them, the radiation was the least of their problems. In my eyes, uh, this is uh, the main consequence also for, for health. It's uh, because uh, elderly people who were extracted forcefully from their uh, habitats, uh, they don't live for long. They were taken away from their uh, orchards, from their gardens, and they put in the apartment houses, and it's a tremendous shock for them. And uh, I think it's a very big problem. But some families did make their way back to their homes, quite a few within a year of the accident. The authorities, concerned that old people were more likely to die of broken hearts than radiation, allowed them to stay. Among them, Ivan and Maria Semenyuk. Don't they worry about radiation? He says that uh, he professionally he was uh, like a guard for, for many years, even in the Chernobyl power plant, and uh, so he had, had seen many, many stories and many things, and uh, nothing special here. Were there any health problems that you've noticed in the community here? So, no, they didn't notice anything. They just tell that they're getting older, and uh, a gentleman is uh, 75, as a lady is 73. There are some people who are saying that thousands will have died as a result of Chernobyl, maybe tens of thousands. What, what's your opinion of that? He says that the main problem is uh, stress, because uh, if they would not be affected by some rumors, by some pressure, the, the, the psychological uh, pressure uh, would be much better. It was a very uh, great psychological discomfort, and uh, th that was the cause of many, of many uh, deaths. One irony of Chernobyl is that as humans left, animals and birds recolonized the area. And while some scientists record a decline in biodiversity, others have reported species not seen there for decades. Wolves, moose, black storks. The exclusion zone is now one of Europe's most thriving wildlife sites, and it wakes to a majestic dawn chorus, as captured here by sound recordist Peter Cusack. Whatever the dangers of nuclear accidents, they are undeniably small compared to other risks. 
Even the worst scientific projections from Chernobyl are dwarfed by the thousands killed each year in coal mining accidents. And millions of us will die prematurely from contaminants pumped out by coal, gas and oil-fired power stations, let alone from vehicle exhaust fumes and emissions of industrial toxins like benzenes and lead, not to mention CO2. How to put this risk in context is a major preoccupation for many scientists. Among them is Britain's former chief scientific officer, Professor Sir David King, who's been dismayed by the hysterical media coverage of Fukushima. The potential for exposing yourself to radiation if you take an air flight between London and New York is many, many times greater than the potential to suffer from radiation, drinking uh, tap water in Tokyo, or in fact, walking around Fukushima. So I think the problem is, as soon as radiation is detected, we don't look at the tables of what is the dangerous level of risk. We simply see a risk. In fact, almost every specialist I spoke to, physicists, doctors, even undoubted victims of Chernobyl, accepted that everything has some risk, and the great majority expressed support for nuclear power. Yet it's hard to think of any singular industrial event that caused the dislocation of Chernobyl or the political fallout. To this day, people in Ukraine talk of pre-Chernobyl and post-Chernobyl as though there were two different epochs. The accident ravaged the economy. It wrecked the last vestiges of Soviet self-confidence and public trust in communist authority. It almost certainly contributed to the collapse of the communist regime. And here in the West, whatever the truth, the fallout from Chernobyl chilled the nuclear debate for a whole generation. It looks like Fukushima might have the potential to do the same. Fallout, the legacy of Chernobyl, was presented by Nick Ross. The producer was Brian King. It was an above-the-title production for BBC Radio 4.